Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, April 1st, 1986, a group of researchers visit Mount Vernon, Virginia to begin an exhumation of the grave of George Washington. This was part of a larger research project to better understand the founding fathers and what scientists found when they did this exhumation led to some very interesting information about Washington. It also created some misinformation that we are in some ways living with today. So here to discuss the exhumation of George Washington is, as always, Nicole Hammer of Columbia and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Kelly, we should be clear that Washington wasn't exactly buried. He's in a, mm-hmm. in a lead coffin, which mm-hmm. resides in an above ground tomb on the Mount Vernon grounds. But nevertheless, why are scientists at this moment um, going back into his coffin? Well, I think there's so much that we can find out through DNA now, and it's kind of really exciting to be able to see what new information that we can learn about George Washington. There's also been so many myths circulated about him and his wooden teeth and, you know, um, certain aspects of his life that I think people are curious to know about. Um, And so they started doing this process to figure out if they could really bring some truth uh, to light about some ideas about George Washington and his biology. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. You kind of get this sense that it's like, we have this new DNA technology, we have this new tool, this, um, so like, let's play with it. And so what do we want to do? Well, let's figure out some things about our founding fathers. I don't think it's a coincidence that this is that pretty soon after the bicentennial, you know, I think there's just a sort of interest in founding fathers. Um, I want to get into some of the things they discover, but Nikki, I mean, you are our watcher of conspiracy theories, and I mentioned in the opening that this did lead to some conspiracy theories. Um, so what is discovered and how does it connect to some of the sort of untruths about Washington that are out there? So they start to do the DNA testing and they get back the results and find out that he has lizard DNA. Hmm. That seemed wrong um, yes. for a variety of reasons. Um, and what they realized was that the Mount Vernon region is actually a breeding ground for salamanders. And so some of the salamander DNA had kind of mixed in with George Washington's. But it leads to this conspiracy theory about lizard people having been responsible for the so founding of the United States. this is where that comes States. from? This is where that comes from. <laughs> Strange per- but true. <laughs> Strange but true. How how pernicious is this theory? I mean, is it so? And I've sort of loosely heard the lizard people founded this country thing. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's given rise to all sorts of conspiracy theories. I mean, the lizard people conspiracy has gotten a big boost on the internet because, you know, first of all, the internet sort of fosters conspiracy theories. But of course, some of the original reporting comes out and people circulate that. And so it has this like kernel of believability because you can find it in newspapers. Um, But then it gets into like bigger and wilder conspiracies about lizard people living in Shasta Mountain um, and all kinds of things um, that continue to evolve from there, so to speak. <laughs> All right. Uh, so listeners, now you know the, the, the origin of that conspiracy theory, but you actually don't know. Um, I can't believe that we, we got this far without actually breaking here. Um, I started, I've started to believe this story. Um, I, I, Kelly, I've kind want, of convinced myself. Yeah, Kelly, do you want to tell them? 
<laughs> April Fools. Yeah, okay, this is not true. None of this is true. I wish it was true. This is true. Washington meets Jurassic Park. I know, like, exactly. <laughs> meets, meets Alex Jones. Uh, Spielberg but, is no, going to no, be all over this. Uh, yes. None of this is true. This is uh, our, our attempt at a historical esoteric April Fools. Um, nevertheless, gotcha. uh, started from the mind of producer Jacob Feldman that we could do a lizard people George Washington thing. <laughs> Salamander DNA. Uh all of the preceding four minutes are untrue, as far as we know. <laughs> they never exhumed Washington's body. <laughs> Washington. They did not find. I don't even know if salamanders breed in Mount Vernon. None of that is true. Uh, uh, nevertheless, it is April first, um, and if if listeners, you will uh, now help me hit the reset button and actually believe things I'm going to tell you from now on, because what we are going to talk about actually on this show is true. Uh, so let's sort of start over and talk about our actual topic today, which is. Extremely different, but nevertheless very interesting, and did happen on April 1st in 1970. So April 1st, 1970. Here we go. You ready? Uh, President Nixon was actually the president, not a lizard, in 1970. He signed the Public Health Cigarette Smoking Act, which banned cigarette ads from airing on television and radio. Um, As you know, cigarette advertising was a massive part of radio, print, and TV through the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, the conversation of public health around cigarettes starts to take a turn in the 60s, and by early 1970, there is pressure to stop advertising on TV specifically. And we'll talk about what turned the tide, but basically on this day, Nixon felt the pressure, a lot of it political pressure, and he signed this law, barring cigarette ads from TV and radio, and the law was to go into effect uh, starting in 1970. And on the night of January 1st, 1971, the last cigarette ad on U.S. television aired. It was an ad for Virginia Slims. It was carried at the last possible legal minute, 11.59 p.m. on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. That was the last cigarette ad on television. So I've already introduced our guests, so let's dive right in. Uh, Nikki, what is your sense of why it I guess, I don't know, why it takes all the way until the 70s um, and why it's Nixon, of all people, who decides to say, okay, no more more cigarette ads on TV and radio. Well, why it takes all the way to the late 1960s, 1970s to deal with this is because of big tobacco. Um, The science had been developed for some time about the harm that tobacco and nicotine have for people's health. Um, But tobacco was a huge industry. It was an industry that much of the United States was built upon. Um, And when it came to television and radio, and and to be um, fair, print as well, uh, it was a huge part of the advertising revenue that made these forms of media possible. I mean, on television, on any given day on one of the networks, you were exposed to five to 10 minutes of cigarette advertising. Um, So there was a lot of it. And it's not really until you get really grassroots activists um, and public interest lawyers who begin to try to find ways to push back against the power of big tobacco, that you get this kind of sea change that happens in the 1970s. I should we should point out that these TV ads and, and radio ads are highly persuasive. You know, seeing someone smoking a cigarette was enough to trigger people to want to pick up a cigarette themselves at that moment. And so, you know, unlike print, TV ads I think were the most sort of seductive in mm-hmm. keeping their consumer base going. Right, and this idea that it was cool. It was something yeah. that you could really yeah. get across in um, television advertising and just in in ads ingrained in shows themselves, right? Um, that you would have characters of certain shows smoking particular cigarettes um, as a form right. of kind of embedded advertising. And that certainly continues, right, as a cultural marker in, in, in TV and movies through the 70s and into the 80s and even mm-hmm. beyond. Um, it is very, in- you know, we can talk about this at the end, but it's very interesting how much just kind of like Seeing people smoking in every sense has just sort of, over the course of the last 15, 20 years, really faded away. But Kelly, to your interesting point, I mean, it's in the early 70s, you see this strategy where before this moment, the advertising was just very straightforward, you know, Mm -hmm. here's our product, smoke it. And then it actually starts to embrace this like living dangerously element. But in terms of how we got to this moment, um, there's a couple steps along the way that I think are worth describing and then the the sort of pressures of the moment. So one thing that happens is is in 1965, um, there is a there is a a law that that introduces labeling to cigarettes. Um, And then kind of Nikki, can you describe between that moment and 1970? What are the swirling pressures uh, around cigarette advertising? 
So there is this Federal Cigarette Labeling and Advertising Act in 1965 that requires those labels that you see on cigarette packages today. They would get increasingly alarming over time because they found that the labels themselves didn't actually, they weren't that effective. Um, But the real innovation here happens in the late 1960s when a public interest lawyer looks at the landscape of um, cigarette advertising and he thinks to use this... um, FCC regulation, this Federal Communications Commission regulation called the Fairness Doctrine, to push back. And the idea with the Fairness Doctrine is that um, when a controversial issue is covered in broadcasting, it has to show all sides, right? You have to um, give a fair and balanced portrayal of it. And so he makes the argument to the FCC that cigarettes are inherently controversial. And so there should be an opportunity to have significant airtime to argue the other side of cigarette smoking. Cigarette companies say that they're cool and they taste great and all of these things. Well, there should be some space for public health advocates to come forward and say, well, here's the other side of cigarette smoking. And the FCC buys the argument. They don't Mm -hmm. give them the same time, but they give them like one minute of airtime for every three minutes of uh, uh, cigarette advertising to have PSAs about the dangers of smoking that are emotional and, and really effective. It's sort of like the getting Al Capone on tax evasion kind of thing. Exactly. It's like you can't actually get cigarette <laughs> manufacturers on the health effects, but you can invoke the fairness doctrine uh, to sort of kneecap the advertising. Um, I mean, Kelly, the other part of this conversation, I want to get to Nixon too, but the other mm-hmm. part of this conversation is, you know, we tend to think of it as cigarette companies versus the world, but you read these accounts and television executives were on the side of the cigarette advertisers oh, because yeah. they were saying, this is a huge part of our life. big money. Yeah. This is big money. I mean, if you think about how much money is being invested in these advertisements to then say, well, now these are banned. These are considered illegal. Uh, a lot of companies were running to figure out how are we going to create additional revenue or new revenue to supplement the amount of income that was coming in because of these advertisements. And well, let's talk about Nixon himself. I mean, why is he the president who does this? Um, I get a feeling that he does it semi-reluctantly, as is the case yes. with a lot of Nixon moments. Yeah, the, the man is captive to his times in a lot of ways. He ends up doing a, a lot of things that he doesn't want to do because they're popular, because there's a lot of pressure from grassroots activists who are very well organized in this period, and in part because Big Tobacco kind of comes along and says, look, we don't want to keep having these on-air ads that talk about how bad smoking is for you. Like, this isn't working out for us. Um, And so they kind of reason out that, well, we can take all this money we're spending on television and on radio and we can put it to other places that won't trigger these PSAs about the deadliness of our product. Um, And so under sort of collapse of the big tobacco lobbying um, and then also all of that public pressure. Nixon, who himself was a pretty heavy pipe smoker, um, finally relents and goes along with the FCC. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So one other little tidbit about this, which is this law gets implemented in early 1970, in in April 1970. Um, It's set to go in effect 1971, you would think, okay, 1971, it's going to start on January 1st, 1971, but there's actually a deal negotiated that it's going to kick in on January 2nd because the, the, the tobacco companies want to get one last round of New Year's Day college football game advertising in. And so there's a flood of ads on January 1st, 1971. And then as we said at 1159, the last one for Virginia Slims it runs and then the switch gets turned off. Another interesting ripple effect here is this is when a lot of networks start adding more late night programming to make up for the lost revenue, right? I mean, it used to be the case that a lot of networks would just kind of turn off uh, late at night. And here they said, well, we need more hours uh, in which to advertise. This is where we maybe got that second late night show or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, So thank Big Tobacco for those late night shows and all of those reruns. (laughs) Yeah, we wouldn't have have James Corden if it weren't for- (laughs) Look what I'd be doing at 2 (laughs) a.m. Uh, so, Kelly, uh, you know, yeah. l- as we start to wrap up here, I mean, I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I mean, we weren't around to witness this change, but I think even in the course of our lifetimes, we've seen a sort of shift. I mean, I, th- I think I have early memories of like certainly, you know, I mean, Joe Camel, for instance, yeah. was uh. 1991. That was uh, when when there was a conversation about like, hey, this is a cartoon telling kids to smoke cigarettes. Like, this is probably <laughs> bad. But you know, 
Um, can you just paint that picture it's of how so much this crazy. has sort of receded it's from so the public crazy. imagination? Yeah, so this is so bad. But I remember taking a vacation to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina when I was like a kid. And my dad got us all matching T-shirts that said, you've come a long way, baby. <laughs> and at the time, I had no idea that that was a slogan for a cigarette. But the ways that, you know, children could identify Joe the Camel more than Mickey Mouse, more than Fred Flintstone. Um, I mean, in some ways, the damage had been done, right? Because children had already internalized these concepts or ideas. I even remember, maybe I'm dating myself too as a child of the 80s, but like, do you remember those little cigarette packs where it was like gum Mm -hmm. and you could like unwrap it and chew the gum, but you could also get like a couple puffs out of it? Like they were inculcating in children at these early ages uh, that you too could smoke or be, you know, that it would be cool and all of that. And so, um, so yeah, there's still damaging effects, even though it's gone from TV and radio print, it's still around. But but I think where the real lore is, is film. So you can do a lot of, you know, strategic advertising just through having the main character or the, the star of a film smoke a cigarette or the lead actor or actress on a show smoke a cigarette. And that is um, that does the same work in just in a different way. That cultural shift is so important because one thing that I've noticed now is that on the um, little ratings box that pops up, you get a warning for things like nudity and for language and Mm -hmm. for smoking, which is something that you could not have imagined even 20 years ago. Um, But it's such a shift from like the days of candy cigarettes and Joe Camel to a culture in which smoking, in part because of arguments about secondhand smoke, has really become... You know, depending on where you live in the country, the the incidence of cigarette smoking has absolutely plummeted in the U.S. It looks very differently in other parts yes. of the world. Um, we should do this in another episode because we've been talking mostly here about cultural forces. Um, there's a lot of literature that says that the thing that actually has sort of tamped down smoking um, is just taxation, right? And cigarettes yep. are just mm-hmm. way more expensive than they used to be, and that's a huge disincentive. Um, and so, you know, I think it's this combination of factors. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, there's probably another episode to be done around cigarette taxes at some yeah. point. Yeah. Um, and vaping. Then yep. Yep. E-cigs. All All those, that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, okay, but we are going to leave it there. Uh, this has been fun. We got a two-for-one here. One not real, <laughs> one actually real. Uh, so, um, Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you as always. Thank you. My pleasure. And happy April Fool's Day. Nicole Hemmer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, listener-supported, artist-owned podcasts. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. Thanks to everyone who gets in touch with questions, comments, potential topics. You can email us, thisdaypod at gmail.com. There is also a contact form at thisdaypod.com. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon. The new Virginia Slims, the slim cigarette for women only, tailored for the feminine hand. Slimmer than the fat cigarette men smoke, with flavor women like. Mellow, mild Virginia flavor. New Virginia Slims. Radio Tokyo.